It's this. Suppose we solve this problem and solve it decisively. What new problems might be created because we have solved the problem? Now, the automobile solved some very important problems for most people, but in doing so has poisoned our air, has choked our cities with traffic, and has contributed toward the destruction of some of the beauty of our natural landscape. Uh, antibiotics have certainly solved some significant problems for almost all people but in doing so, have resulted in the weakening of what we call our immune systems. Television has solved several important problems, but in solving them, has changed the nature of political discourse, has led to a serious decline in literacy, and has even made the traditional process of socializing children difficult if not impossible. Now, it's doubtful that you could think of any single technology that did not generate new problems as a result of its having solved an old problem. Of course, it's sometimes very difficult to know what new problems will arise as a result of a technological solution. Benedictine monks invented the mechanical clock in the 13th century in order to be more precise in performing their canonical prayers, which they needed to do seven times a day. Had they known that the mechanical clock would eventually be used by merchants as a means of establishing a standardized workday, and then a standardized product. That is that the clock would be used as an instrument for making money instead of serving God. The monks might have decided that their sundials were quite sufficient. Had Gutenberg foreseen that his printing press with movable type would lead to the breakup of the Holy Roman See he surely would have used his old wine press to make wine and not books. In the 13th century, perhaps it didn't matter so much if people lacked a technological vision, perhaps not, not even in the 15th century. But in a technological society such as ours, we can no longer afford to move into the future with our eyes tightly closed. We need to speculate in an open-eyed way about negative possibilities. But as I've said, it's no easy matter to know what sorts of problems a new technology will generate. To produce interesting and responsible answers uh, requires knowledge of the history of technology and of technology's social effects and of the principles governing technological change, all of which, <clears throat> I'm sorry to say, most Americans know little about. In fact, uh, the average college-educated American cannot tell you, given a thousand-year margin of error, when the phonetic alphabet was invented, or given a 500-year margin of error when the printing press with movable type was invented, let alone say anything intelligible about the social and psychic effects of these inventions. Well, we'll probably need to do something about that in the years ahead. But it's not sufficient to reflect in a general way on the possible costs of technology. In order to give some focus to our reflections, we have to pose a fourth question. It's this. Which people and what institutions might be most seriously harmed by a technological solution? 
Now, this was the question, uh, by the way, that gave rise to the Luddite movement in England during the years 1811 to 1818. The people we call Luddites were skilled manual workers in the garment industry at the time when mechanization was taking command and the factory system was being put into place. They knew perfectly well what advantages mechanism would bring to most people. But they also saw with equal clarity how it would bring ruin to their own ways of life, especially to their children who were being employed as virtual slave laborers in factories. They resisted technological change by the simplistic and in the end useless expedient of smashing to bits industrial machinery, which they continued to do until they were imprisoned or killed by the British Army. Now, no one knows where the word Luddite came from, but the word has come to mean a person who resists technological change in any way, and it's usually used as an insult. Now, why this is so is a bit puzzling to me, since only a fool doesn't know that new technologies always produce winners and losers. And there is nothing irrational about loser resistance. Bill Gates, who is, of course, a winner, uh, knows this. And because he is no fool, uh, his propaganda continuously implies that computer technology can bring harm to no one. Well, that's the way of winners. They want losers to be grateful and enthusiastic, and especially, best, best of all, to be unaware that they are losers. Let's take school teachers as an example of losers who are deluded into thinking they are winners. Now, I think you'll agree with me if I say that we need more teachers and that we ought to pay more to those we have. I think you could hardly disagree that school boards are resistant to hiring more teachers and to paying them more, and that they complain continuously about a shortage of funds. Now, this resistance and those complaints notwithstanding, the fact is that school boards are now preparing to spend in the aggregate billions of dollars to wire schools in order to accommodate computer technology and for reasons that are by no means clear. There certainly does not exist any compelling evidence that PCs or the internet or any other manifestation of computer technology can do for children what good, well-paid, underburdened teachers can do. So, where is the outcry from teachers? They are losers in this deal and they are serious losers. Here, for example, is an announcement uh, of, a, of an insult to teachers which I take I could have used many others, but this one is from uh, June 1996 edition of the Washington Post. I'm quoting, the state of